Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when your disciples and friends deserted and left you, remained alone in the hands of sinful men, like a most gentle lamb within the jaws of a ravenous wolf. Strengthen my excessive weakness and confirm my too great unstableness by the support of your grace, and join me to yourself with the bonds of love, that I may neither have no wish nor the power ever to depart or separate myself from you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who allowed yourself to be led around bound by an armed band and taken to Annas, allowing yourself to be stood before him as though you were a common criminal or robber. O unspeakable gentleness of my Redeemer, look, while they take and drag and thrust you forward, you uttered not a single word of complaint or murmur or word of resistance, but in silence you followed them wherever they led you, obeying their commands and permitted their wanton injuries to you. Grant, O Lord, that these your virtues may shine in me to the everlasting glory of your name. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, King of heaven and earth, who in great humility, as poor and needy and of no account, was stood before the proud high priest and most sweetly endured the dreadful blow which his impious servant put upon you. Restrain, I beg you, in me all outbreak of anger and passion. Suppress all acts of indignation and quench with me all, within me all desire of revenge, that when I am provoked by injury I may not be disturbed, I may, not, may offer no resistance, may suffer no disquiet, but endure everything with a quiet mind. May I even repay evil with good. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who permitted himself to be led bound in a shameful manner to Caiaphas, that you might deliver us from the penalty of eternal death, restoring to us true liberty. Make me most ready to endure every reproach and all contempt for your name's sake. Grant that in the very middle of ridicule and outrage I may give you thanks with a perfect heart and by means of these trials may grow and increase more and more in your love. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when three times denied by your Apostle Peter, mercifully turned and looked upon him with kindness and brought him to repentance and holy sorrow for his sin. In like manner, may you turn upon me also your eye of mercy and love, that I may weep over my past sins with the tears of true penitence and may never again commit them. May I never be found sinning against your goodness in word or deed. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who stood before the elders and the people of the Jews with a calm countenance and humble look, who did not refuse to be falsely accused and to suffer many injuries. Give me grace never to say an untrue word or to falsely accuse my neighbour, but that I may bear with all quietness of heart the calumnies that are heaped upon me. Casting all my troubles upon you, may I always in silence look for the grave and consolation at your hands. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who when Caiaphas the high priest adjured you by the name of God, declared the truth and proclaimed yourself the Son of God, and did not refuse to be counted by him and the rest who stood by as a blasphemer. May I fully abhor this contempt and offence against you. May in I in every place reverence the, respect, the presence of your divinity and majesty. May I think of you, adore, praise and love you, above all things, for ever and for ever. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 7. Then some of the residents of Jerusalem began to say, Isn't this the man they are trying to kill? And yet here he is, speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. Do the real rulers really know that this man is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. Whenever the Christ comes, no one will know where he comes from. Then Jesus, while teaching in the temple courts, cried out, You both know me and know where I come from, and I have not come on my own initiative, but the one who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I have come from him, and they sent me. So then they tried to seize Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him, because his time had not yet come. Yet many of the crowd believed in him and said, Whenever the Christ comes, he won't perform more miraculous signs than this man did, will he? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things about Jesus, and so the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Then Jesus said, I will be with you for only a little while longer, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jewish leaders said to one another, Where is he going, that we cannot find him? He is not going to the Jewish people dispersed amongst the Greeks, and teach the Greeks, is he? What did he mean by saying, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. On the last day of the feast, the greatest day, Jesus stood up and shouted out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. Just as the scripture says, From within him will flow rivers of, rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, whom those believed in him were going to receive. For the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the crowd began to say, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But still others said, No, for the Christ doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Then the scriptures say that the Christ is a descendant of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived. So there was a division in the crowd because of Jesus. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Then the officers returned to the chief priests and the Pharisees, who said to them, Why didn't you bring him back with you? The officers replied, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered, You haven't been deceived too, have you? None of the rulers or the Pharisees have believed in him, have they? But this rabble, who do not know the law, are accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before, and who was one of the rulers, said, our law doesn't condemn a man unless it first hears from him and learns what it is that he is doing, does it? They replied, You aren't from Galilee too, are you? Investigate carefully and you will see that no prophet ever came from Galilee. And each one departed to his own house. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus continued preaching in the temple in Jerusalem, much to the annoyance of the people of Jerusalem, who were, it seems, well aware of the plans to have him killed. In their mutterings against him, they wondered if perhaps the authorities thought that he was the Christ after all. And they then thought themselves the better, for they knew that he could not possibly be the Christ, because they knew where he came from. But of course, Jesus was well aware of their cunning arguments, 
and countered by proclaiming that of course they knew him and where he came from, but that they did not know where he originally came from. The father, and likewise that he had not come of his own choice, but that of the father. Although the crowd did not know God, Jesus did, because he had been sent by God. To the crowd, this was surely the biggest of all possible blasphemies, and enraged they tried to get a hold of him. But as usual, he passed them by because the time for his death had not yet come. Let us stop the argument and consider the wickedness of the argument put about by the crowd. In their anger they were selective in their use of prophecy. To support their claims, they refer to Micah 5.2, where the Messiah is referred to as a king who emerges from the distant past. On the other hand, they did not consider the first parts of this very same verse, which tells that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Their familiarity with Jesus had bred a contempt for him, and spawned the wickedness beyond measure. For us this is a double warning, not only against looking to justify our own desires through the law, but also selective use of the scriptures by picking sections that support our argument and disregarding those that do not, failing to read the passages entirely before coming to conclusions. But the more that Jesus taught, the more determined the Jewish authorities became to be rid of him. But in their assessment of him, they made a fundamental error. They assumed that he came from Galilee, whereas they knew the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Jesus was, of course, born in Bethlehem, as we know, and off the royal line of David. But in their haste to condemn him, they had failed to establish the facts. Without inquiry, they would not have known. They just assumed that because Jesus spoke with a Galilean accent, he was from Galilee. Forgetting, conveniently, of course, that the prophet Jonah was also a Galilean. The Pharisees were increasingly determined to catch Jesus, and yet the people were in two minds. On the one hand, they were indignant that this was just a mere peasant from Galilee, from where it was said that no good would ever come. But on the other hand, they admired his teaching. They suffered the penalty of being too quick to judge Jesus without truly listening to what he had to say. Then, perhaps they would have been less interested in where he came from, and more interested in his message and where he was going. We too can be guilty of prejudgment and of getting things completely the wrong way around. Sometimes this is totally unfair and based on nothing more than the first impression or a careless word or two. But we end up being placed in a difficult position. Take care when you form opinions of people come to too quick a conclusion, and you may well come to regret it. Let us pray. O Lord, we beseech you, absolve your people from their offences, that through your bountiful goodness we may all be delivered from the bands of those sins which by our frailty we have committed. Grab this, O Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our beloved Lord and Saviour. Amen.